now. Greetings from First Missionary Baptist Church of Cave Springs, Arkansas. It's another glorious Sunday morning uh, filled with the beauties of spring. Everything is coming back to life. And, of course, we have the knowledge and hope of eternal life, which there was an old saying used to be said, hope springs eternal. Well, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a hope in him, and he is eternal. So, through the possible, through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and someday all who believe in him shall also bloom in the beauty of the eternal glory. So, perfect life with our Lord and Savior. Praise be to God for his excellent, excellent greatness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, prepare our hearts to study the word today, to hear the word and apply it to our own lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to come to you through uh, the technology of the age, Lord God, that your word may go all over the world. And Father, we thank you. Now, as we study, help us to see, receive the wisdom of it, apply it to our lives, and then, Lord, help us to see our sin and ask forgiveness, Lord. Repent of our sin, ask forgiveness, and thank you for our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our study today is in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, talking about false teachers. False teachers, the warnings against. In the beginning, God warned against false prophets, and now he's re He's warning us against false teachers in our churches. So as we read verses 1, 2, and 3, be prepared to see what Peter has for us here. Verse, chapter 2, verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Lord God, as we read these words, there is sharp rebuke against those that would deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we just pray that you give us the wisdom through the truth of your word to see a lie when we hear it and recognize it as such. In Jesus' name, amen. So we go right to verse 1. It says, where do these deceitful souls come from anyway? How can someone that claims to be a Christian has a testimony of being saved, and yet they come and come into the churches with wild ideas and destructive uh, errors and lie, give false testimony, all those things. How can they lie? More than likely, they're not a child of God. Well, how can anyone read the scriptures, the word of God, and at the same time pervert what they have just read? Well, the basic answer is that they are influenced by Satan. Jesus said Satan was a liar. He was a liar from the beginning and the father of lies. Satan was the first false teacher. He was a false prophet, so to speak. He persuaded a third of all the angels of heaven to rebel against God with him. How persuasive is that? When the angels had all the glory of God surrounding them. And all of a sudden, here comes Satan and says, I'm going to be your God. And they followed him. A third of the whole host of heaven. And God banished Satan with his demonic followers to earth. Well, to the spirit world of the earth is where he went. He's still here. We can't see him, but we see his effects daily. He is the evil that surrounds us. 
Well, then Satan entered into the serpent in the Garden of Eden and perverted the Word of God and caused Eve and Adam to disobey the Word of God. And so sin entered into the world and death by sin. And here we are today, still being exposed to satanic lies through false teachers. How is the best way to recognize a lie? By knowing the truth. If you know the truth of a matter, then all the lies in the world cannot sway you. Jesus said, I am the truth. You can't get any more basic than that. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe in him, trust him as your Lord and Savior to give you eternal life, then that truth should never be swayed. You know who he is, you know that he loves you, and you know that you love him. Well, the word of God, it's true. It's God's word. We are to know it intimately. We are to base everything we say and do in our lives on the word of God. In verse 1, Peter tells us that there were false prophets among God's people in Israel from the very beginning. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, I think it's time we have the time to read this and to see the penalty that was assigned to a false prophet once he was proved to be a liar. Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. That is a damnable defense, and God has a place for those. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the God, whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, keep his commandments, obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death because he had spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to, trust thee out of, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. There's no difference today from the time that that commandment was given. If someone is in the church presenting error, presenting other gods, false gods, a false Christ, all these things, false commandments, then we don't have the authority to put them to death, but we have the authority to send them out to Satan, send them out of the church. We have the authority to avoid them. We have the authority to let God handle it because God said, vengeance is mine. So when we run into someone that we know is actually teaching an error, we are to come before them, present the error to them. If they change their minds and say, oh, I didn't know that, then you have saved the soul. You have turned them back in the right direction. But if they refuse, we are to exclude them. We are to take them out of their position of teaching and move on and turn them over to God and let him do whatever he wants to do with them. For you see, God is gracious. He's not willing that any should perish, even false teachers. If we give them over to God, God can change their minds, God can change their hearts, and perhaps the talent that they had of speaking would be turned from falsehoods to the truth. How glorious would that be? But that's our God. He doesn't pour out his wrath on anyone until it's the time. Here we are today, still being exposed to satanic lies through false teachers. Well, Jesus said, I am the truth, and that's what we stick with. He said it. In verse 1, Peter tells us there were false prophets among God's people in Israel, as we saw in Deuteronomy. Now, God is explicit. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. 
and false teachers have a way to subtly bring in error of teaching and all of a sudden present other gods so subtly that sometimes even a Christian can't recognize it. <coughs> God hates a lie. We also as a Christian should hate lies when we t and be totally prepared to recognize them. Verse 1 says, Here shall, There shall be false teachers among you. That's a fact. There will be here. Be prepared because they sneak in. They sneak in lies for their own benefit or for Satan's benefit. As Satan uses many people, many professing to know the Lord Jesus Christ who really don't are serving Satan. Matthew 7.15 tells us this. It said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they're acting like Christians, but inwardly they are ravening wolves ready to devour. Peter doesn't say they may come. He says they shall come. They are among us, and they bring in damnable heresies is the way he puts it. Well, today there are those who leave out in their teaching the atoning power of the blood of Jesus. They deny his resurrection. Here Peter simply states, even denying the Lord that bought them. Christ died for all. Not just for the believers, he died for all. That all may come to him in repentance and be saved. Well, if you de deny the Lord God that bought you, you are already condemned. Ch third chapter of John, I think it's verse 17, says, uh, if you don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ, you are condemned already. Jesus said, you are dead, dead in sin. Peter simply states that they deny the Lord that bought them. Recognize and avoid false teachers because they bring upon themselves swift destruction. What is the penalty for denying Christ? Eternal condemnation. Ephesians 6 and 7, 6, 11 puts, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. My friends, when you know the Lord, Jesus intimately by faith, you are indwelled by his Holy Spirit. And 1 John 4, 4 tells us, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you are truly a child of God, through his grace, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are indwelled with that Holy Spirit of God the moment that you believe. Praise God for this marvelous grace. So where do we perceive the greatest danger? In our young people, probably the greatest danger is in the young, those that are uh, hungry for the word but immature, and Satan can twist their innocence to his own devices. He twisted Eve and Adam. They were innocent creatures. Creatures of God that were to inherit the garden and to dress it and keep it forever and ever. But they disobeyed God's word. Satan twisted the words of God and he says, Thou shalt not surely die, not die. God said, you will die if you eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. So he left out, switched it over, says, you will not die. And here we are suffering even today because of it. You know, young people, they're the same way. Many are innocent. They want to find God. They want to find the Lord Jesus Christ. They find false teachers that lead them off that path. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We have a formative year in our children. Formative years that start actually when the child is still in the womb. We need to be telling them about Jesus Christ. By the time they go to school at six years old or so, 
they become out in the world. And if we haven't prepared them, the world will teach them. Verse 2, many shall follow their pernicious ways, the awful truth. Ways that bring destruction to lives. Lives on this earth, even today, while we're living, we will be destroyed. And even the total loss of souls, then into eternal condemnation. We lose this uh, physical body. We can also lose this soul. And without Christ, the soul is condemned forever and ever. Death, separated from God. And if we live in a disobedient life before God, then even our physical lives are affected, social lives are affected. Everything turns into chaos. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. Well, what in the world does this pernicious mean? Uh, it sounds pretty evil. Well, that's what it is. Uh, things... Consider the blessings of God of more importance than a relation to God himself. That is perniciousness, where Moses, the scripture says, he chose rather to live for God than to have the pleasures of this world for a season. This world is temporary at best in our lives. If we serve God, then the lives are extended into eternity. If we don't, then the lives are destroyed and our souls are cast into hell. So these teachers with pernicious ways are easily recognized by their cult-like demands. One of them says, only we have the truth. Only we have a place in God's kingdom. If they deny Christ Jesus as God, if they demand works for salvation, if they proclaim that religions lead to heaven, beware. Jesus said in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No person comes to God except through him. Jesus Christ is the only way. Peter says these false teachers sway many to follow them by preying on the natural condition of mankind to worship according to his own will not according to God's will. Probably the most subversive is the statement, you know, I like this preacher because he makes me feel good. Makes me feel good about myself. Friends, God in his word says there is no good in anyone. Romans 3 and 10 says there's no, none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have no say in our goodness, our morally straight lives do not lead us anywhere but away from God. We have to follow him and his righteousness. And if someone tells you you must follow your heart, that's already going the wrong way. Jeremiah 17 and 9 says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And who can know it? Well, God knows it. God knows your heart. And Jesus Christ knows your heart. He is God. So, if we go our own way, we will certainly fall away. We have all come to the same conclusion and truthfully say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That is the basis of salvation. To finally admit that you're a sinner and you have no way of fixing it. And you come to the one who can. And you submit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in one step in the right direction. It is the faith that he can save you. We all have come to that conclusion and truthfully say that. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Well, moving on to verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Probably the most driving force of false teachers is the love of money, the love of power, the love of adoration by people, the ostentatious neglect 
of the least of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. We see this in the materialism gospel being flaunted today, distorting the love of God into a fleshly, worldly love which supposedly blesses true believers. If you only believe hard enough, God will give you good health, prosperity, happiness. Yes, give, for God loves a cheerful giver. So the more you give to my ministry, they say, the more you will be blessed. It's kind of a spiritual blackmail, holding the Lord Jesus Christ up for ransom. Peter put it into real words here. He said, they will make merchandise of you. They'll use you to fund their business. They will use you to make them rich. Their philosophy only makes them rich. It's their business. Look at the examples of the prophets. They simply spoke, thus saith the Lord. And how did they fare? They led poor lives. They depended totally on God. What God had them do, no matter what it was, well, in Hebrews 11, verse 37, makes it very plain. He said they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Then Hebrews 35 says, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Their hope was in God, not on worldly things, not on fleshly things. So this new corruption of godly lies, saying if you just believe enough, you will be rich, you will be healthy, you will prosper, you won't be crippled, and if you are, God will heal you. All these things just to make money. Well, God will take care of that, and he will. He promises that he will. And while we're on prophets, how about the apostles? They left behind everything for Christ. They set aside their businesses, whatever they were, whatever they were doing, their families and all, and they followed Christ. Their own wills were given up for his will. They had an opportunity to preach the gospel, and they took it. Paul said in Ephesians 3.8, Unto me is given this grace that I should preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. That was his great thing in life. That was his mission. It didn't matter if they beat him up, jailed him, stoned him, or whipped him or whatever. He simply preached the word of God and knew that Christ would take care of him. God calls each believer to a higher plane than, than the temporary pleasures of this world. The song says, I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today good thought. Verse 3 ends with the statement for false teachers, God is patient, long-suffering, that none should perish, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, even false teachers. But if they continue, they face a judgment. If they die in their sin, God's mercy and grace is, of course, without end, but we should not stand by for false teachers, but we resist it with God's truth. The only way you can defeat a lie is by the truth. We know the truth, so we speak the truth with all confidence. If these refuse the truth, God will take care of them. Psalm 73, David laments how the wicked seems to lead such luxurious lives. He even admitted he was envious when he saw their prosperity. But in Psalm 73 and 17, he said this, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Their end is horrible. Psalm 73 and 27 says, For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. Leave it to God. He takes the vengeance at the proper time. We have this, I want justice right now. I want all this done right now. God says, hey, at one time you were just like them. What if I'd have took vengeance then? 
where would you be today? There's a time when we were in our sin, and we came to Christ for his grace, through his grace, and by faith were saved. Well, all the lost are the same way. They're living in a dead body here on this earth, waiting for God to save them. And we're trying to hurry him up and say, do something, Lord. Do something now. Take us to heaven. Take us out of this chaos. The Lord God says, I'm long-suffering. Many of these will come to me. Many of these will come to me. So we pray for the salvation of those that are enemies of Christ. Verse 3 says, it may be a long time. To us it may seem God is lingering, but judgment is coming. And God is not asleep. God's judgment comes to these false teachers. They are accountable to God, and so are we. If we follow such a person, we will be held accountable also. We as believers are held accountable to a higher, higher degree because we are his children and carry his name. Don't be a part of those who are pictured in verse 2. It says, many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. If you're having a good time in church and you realize that you're not learning you realize that the Bible is not being taught, come to your senses. Know the truth, react to the truth, and move on to where the Word of God is preached. Then make His Word a priority in life. Read His Word, for His Word is truth, and the truth exposes lies. And above all, Jesus said the truth will set you free. If you know the truth, you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have the blessed hope of eternal life in glory with him forever and ever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your word is so refreshing. Your word brings us out of doubt. Your word shows us the truth. And when we know the truth, then, of course, we are set free. Help us, Lord, to react to that truth, pass it on to others, pass on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to all that we meet. And above all, let us know our sin, repent of it, confess our sin, Lord, that you may forgive us, cleanse us from all sin, and make us righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord God, what a promise and what a hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.